Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So we're going to talk a little bit, a uh, relatively simple topic, and I'll try and keep it concise, about fashion and swords, uh, particularly in the 15th century, but you could take this back to the 14th or slightly later into the 16th. So what's interesting when we talk about the development of medieval swords, and you can also extrapolate this slightly to armour, but this particularly applies to weapons, particularly swords, but you could, you could take this out to apply to other arms and armour of the period as well, is that we absolutely do have fashions and trends, developments and changes, and I talk about them an awful lot on this channel. Um, but we also have to remember that some of these um, swords, so this is a 15th century style longsword, this is the Albion Ringek, incidentally, um, did have a period of life, and that period of life sometimes could be generations. But we have to be careful about not over-exaggerating that point, because it varies with period, and we have to concede that there was a very rapid development of um, both technological developments, but also fashion styles uh, that moved forwards and changed. When we go from, say, about the uh, early 14th century through to the early 16th century. So despite the fact we're only um, really talking about 200 years there, there was a lot of uh, change and movement development in military hardware and even, you know, civilian clothing, of course, during that period. And you might think, well, Matt, 200 years is a long time, but actually is it that long in generations? Um, if we go back, uh, we go back further into history, into the Bronze Age, for example, we find that there isn't such a rapid development of changes in things like swords, uh, and probably there wasn't a, such a rapid development in things like fashion or, you know, certainly jewellery and other things that survive um, from that period as well. But by the time we get to the late Middle Ages, shall we say, and into the Renaissance, we see we see an acceleration of development. So that kind of means that when we come to day Dating, obviously originals, this is uh, made circa, what, probably about 2010, if I remember correctly, but the originals that these are based on would have had a uh, kind of date whereby they definitely couldn't date before that, but they certainly could have remained in use after that. But the question is, how long after that? And that is very, very, very problematic subject in the study of arms and armour. And it touches on how we date items of um, armour or swords from things like funeral effigies and brasses, obviously manuscript art as well, um, and of course, archaeologically, um, when we actually find the real artefacts, whether it's from the ground or rivers or in collections or whatever, sometimes even in tombs. And we do know that swords could remain in use for several generations. And we also know this, well, I mean, we know this from various different, um, uh, various different evidence we have. One of those is actually the, um, the period artwork, but another one is the actual text, the written text from the period, where sometimes we have wills, um, which, uh, and sometimes even uh, just uh, inventories of, of stuff that's held in arsenals, or, but also in people's houses, that show us that in some cases, particular uh, single objects like grandfather's sword or grandfather's bassinet were actually handed down. Now, we don't know, of course, whether they were necessarily used. So in some cases, just like today, I mean, I personally know, obviously I work in the world of antique swords and antique arms and armour, but I personally know people that own their grandfather's sword from World War I, for example. Um, and um, and I'm still looking for, for my great-grandfather's um, sword for World War One. It's out there somewhere. I'll find it one day. Um, but the fact is that sometimes things are handed down, but that doesn't mean they're still used. So if I still have my great-grandfather's sword from World War I, uh, I, I wouldn't still be um, carrying it, certainly in a military sense or in a kind of service sense. But if I was a serving officer in the appropriate regiment, which was the Royal Army Medical Corps in his case, um, then I could potentially wear his sword for parade purposes. And again, I know people serving in the British military, in some cases foreign militaries as well actually, and in some of those I've actually sold swords to, and they do wear antique swords. So in some cases, it could be that in the 15th century, someone who owned 
say this is grandfather's sword, they might still wear it around because it was grandfather's sword and maybe he carried it, you know, in, um, in the Battle of Pate, for example, and I I'm now living in the year 1500, but you know, 50 years ago, oh, when he, in the Hundred Years' War, um, he, was a, he was a fantastic leader he was, and I love the fact that I've still got his sword. So it could be that in the year 1500, there were people wandering around wearing swords from the year 1450. Um, but their sword would look, to some degree, a bit antiquated. So if I'd grab another Albion here, um, this, is, this has certain stylistic differences. So this is a, <laughs> it's a modified version of the mercenary. It's a little bit complicated, but the grip is actually by uh, Todd, uh, Todd Cutler. Um, and uh, they are stylis stylistically different swords. Now, whilst the blades, actually, both of these blades had a very wide pe um, period of use, they're sort of Type 15 blades, I suppose. Some people might call them a Type 18, I think they're Type 15. Um, and um, this type of blade was actually in use uh, from about the, I guess the middle of the 14th century-ish, uh, right the way through and well into the 16th century. So the blades themselves could be rehilted, and in fact you could stick the, um, you could shorten the, particularly, the, well in fact either of these blades, you could shorten them and stick them on, grab another sword here, this is the Windless Munich, you could st stick them on a later swept hilt uh, military sword, shorten the tang and everything, and no one would necessarily ever know that the sword you were carrying was actually your great-great-grandfather's blade that he'd carried in the Hundred Years' War, because you could still be wearing it in the year 1550, uh, which is quite incredible when you think about it. So the blade could have a very long period of life, and no one would know that it was an old blade. There might be, for those of us who study things for, for example um, armor, sword makers, blade makers markings, you might recognize that the stamp on the blade is a 15th century stamp, but the hilt is a 16th century hilt. So you might be able to say, well, look, this is a reused blade. And there are many examples of these in collections. But the hilt tells us a little bit more. Now, you'll notice partly by uh, accident, actually, that I ended up with these two swords. They actually share uh, some uh, very similar hilt characteristics. They both have what are called scent stopper pommels, uh, quite similar pommels, and they both have curved guards that flare out at the ends. Uh, and each of these features could have been around in the late 14th century, they could have been around in the late 15th century, and they were still around in the 16th century. But there are tendencies. So you'll notice that the grip on the ring egg here is flared at the middle, uh, and that has the practical benefit of keeping your right hand in place when you're using the sword one-handed. Say, for example, you're using a pavis uh, shield or you were on horseback, um, then this is quite ergonomic and it helps keep your hand in place. We don't generally see that feature. There are some 14th century hints of it, but we don't generally see that feature becoming common until fairly far into the 15th century, the kind of, let's say, the first, second quarter of the um, uh, 15th century. Um, generally, what we see before that are grips more like this that are smoother. So it's not a definite point of dating, but generally speaking, the look of this mercenary looks a little bit earlier than this ring egg by virtue of the grip. And there's one example of uh, a development that changed as we went forward in time. So this sword wouldn't really fit if I was doing a 14th century impression, if I was wearing armour from, um, you know, the Battle of Sempak or, or something like that, late something, even, even Agincourt actually, this, so even into the early 15th century, this sword wouldn't really look right. Whereas this sword would because of the grip. Um, this sword would look appropriate for the, uh, the end of the Hundred Years' War, the Wars of the Roses, this kind of period. So this is more mid-15th, late, uh, late, uh, late 15th century, purely because of the grip. So just that one thing. Now, if we start to add features like side rings, okay, or perhaps finger rings. Now, finger rings did actually appear for the first time quite early, around 1400. But side rings don't appear until very, very late in the 15th century. So if you have side rings on a sword, you absolutely wouldn't expect to see that um, at the beginning of the Wars of the Roses or the end of the Hundred Years' War, this kind of period, middle of the 15th century. So there are relatively small functional changes to swords which happen across time, which 
stick them in a certain point. So the question is, coming back to what I think is my original point, um, is how long were swords kept in use at this time, in the late medieval period and early renaissance? And I think the question has, I think that the answer to the question, probably you can summarise it in that blades could be in use for quite a long time. And we do know of examples of 13th century blades um, in 16th century longsword hilts. Uh, we do even know of one example, and I don't know how historically uh, trustworthy it is, but there is an example of a Viking era blade, type 10 blade, in a Landsknecht um, double ring uh, Katzbalger hilt. So, uh, so that's 16th century, that's 600 years difference more or less. So it does happen that blades sometimes had an incredibly long period of use because a good blade is a good blade, but also because it might have uh, family significance. It might be a blade that's been in the family for a long time. It may be a blade that belonged to a famous person or was carried at a famous battle or whatever. But hilts did move on. And in sometimes, as I've shown, in quite subtle ways, sometimes just a slight change in the grip shape. And we do, certainly grips are something which evolve quite a lot in the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, but also, especially in the guard, Pommels, not so much, but there are pommel types which are uh, fit within certain time periods as well. Is it possible that sometimes someone had a 14th century longsword or circa 1400 longsword that they were still carrying completely unaltered, unadulterated, still carrying a hundred years later? Yes, it is possible, and we occasionally see this in art, and obviously we have to add all the caveats about how much we trust historical artwork and how we have to be cautionary with it. Often historical artwork isn't showing a photograph of the time, it's telling a story, often it's a biblical story set 2,000 years earlier, sometimes it's an Old Testament story set uh, two and a half thousand years before, um, sometimes it might be an ancient world, an uh, ancient Greek, so often you see the, the stories about Troy um, or Alexander the Great in medieval art, and so they, the artist will deliberately show things, sometimes that are supposed to look old-fashioned, sometimes that are their idea of what the people then wore, um, or just they're supposed to look outlandish because they're showing foreigners or infidels or whatever, so they give them some weird kind of scimitar type, falchion type sword when that wasn't an actual sword that existed. All of these sort of caveats, but we can nevertheless learn a lot from historical artwork and we do occasionally see weapons which clearly could have been from 100 years or even 200 years earlier shown with no reason for an old weapon to be shown in a later period. So yes, I think sometimes medieval swords did have a long period of use, but usually if you had some money to spend, you would, I mean, even if it was just changing the grip shape, even if it was just getting the, the guard replaced, maybe with the side ring or finger ring or whatever, they would make small changes because fashion and technology did move on quite rapidly in this period. And just like now, I think people wouldn't want to be seen to have something which was horribly out of date and unfashionable, and we have to accept that swords weren't just pointy sharp objects for killing people, they were also statements of your wealth, your place in society, your intention, your seriousness, and everything else. They were symbols, they weren't just weapons. I hope that's been thought provoking and interesting. Uh, give us a like and a subscribe, and I'll see you really soon again for another video about swords or something else on Scholar Gladiatoria channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.